Dear Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much, Lord, for creating this Sabbath day that we can be close to you. And Father, I pray that as we uh, we uh, listen to the word that you have for us, God, that I pray that we will be drawn closer to you and that we will see uh, how you uh, have been working in our lives and how you want to work in our lives, Lord. Thank you so much, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about family of faith. And we're looking at the story of Noah and the flood. This is my family. <laughs> That's my dad and my mom and my brothers and my sister. My dad, how many of, well, first of all, how many of you, by raise of hands, like to read through genealogies in the Bible? How many of you? Do you how many of you say yes? How many of you say no? How many of you don't know what a genealogy is? Okay. <laughs> well, my dad loves reading through the genealogies in the Bible. <laughs> and not only that, but he loves learning about our own family history. And so in my family, my dad has a lot of fun researching our family tree. And so at every family reunion, he always tries to add information to the knowledge that he already has. He'll go around and ask uh, his uncles about stories uh, when they were growing up. And he will always try to find more information about his heritage. And about, oh, I'd say back when I was in college, maybe about five years ago or so, uh, he went down, all the way down to Rouge, Louisiana, because he knew that one of his great great uh, grandfathers, he was, that was where he grew up, and he wanted to find out more information about him. So he went down there and he found out the, he, by going to the library and asking around, he was able to find the place where my grandfather was buried. But when he got there, there was nothing there. And so my dad was standing around looking, well, what, where is, where is the, the grave of my great-great-grandfather? So he actually found out that it was buried underneath the dirt. So he had to go digging for it. So after he dug in the dirt, they dug down, they, got a, they were able to attach a, a rope to it and pull this huge, massive, gravestone out of the ground and my grand my dad was really surprised because my grandfather lived all the way back in 18 he was born in 1844 that sounds funny doesn't it um and you know he was obviously living during the time of slavery and so it was very interesting to see that my grandfather's had such a massive gravestone even though he was living during the time of slavery and so my dad really enjoyed being able to dig up this little bit of piece of family history. But today, you know, I know that family was so important to my dad that he went all the way down there to figure out about his family. But, and family is probably very important to most of us here, but Today we're going to talk about a Bible character who was said to be part of a different kind of family. We know from the Bible, we can see this, that having faith in God's promises, despite what you can see, is how you can be part of God's perfect genealogy. And we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 6. And it says... Now it came to pass, Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And so during this time, we see that God's people, who are called the sons of God, they were intermarrying 
with the daughters of men, which would be Cain's descendants, those who did not follow and worship the true God. And they were, you know, they were intermarrying. So we see that there's heathen uh, people who do not believe in God, people who do believe in God intermarrying with one another. And then we see in verses 5 through 7, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was very grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So Noah still believed in God in a society where evil and corruption pervaded every thought of those around them. Well, what happened? We see here from the spirit of prophecy in the book Patriarchs and Prophets that men put God out of their knowledge and they worship the creatures of their own imagination. And as the re a result, they became more and more debased. The psalmist describes the effect produced upon the worshiper by the adoration of idols. He says, they that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. It is the law of the human mind that by beholding, we become changed. Man will rise no higher than his conceptions of truth, purity, and holiness. If the mind is never exalted above the level of humanity, it is not uplifted by faith to contemplate infinite wisdom and love. The man will be constantly sinking lower and lower. I know that idol worship is not really something that we hear about these days, but in Noah's day, they were worshiping idols that they made to be mainly like themselves. Today, society has become so focused on self it's about how I look. It's about how I feel. And really, this is what it's like. It's like someone looking at themselves in a mirror. For 2 Corinthians 3.18 uh, says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's interesting because in the New King James Version, it says, uh, as we look and behold in a mirror the glory of the Lord. But I kind of like this King James Version better because it makes more sense. If you're beholding yourself, in a, you're looking in a mirror, who are you seeing? You're seeing yourself. If you look through a glass, if you look through a window, you're seeing something else. And so it's like you're beholding through a glass, the view you're seeing when you're looking through the window, you're seeing like, it's almost like you're seeing when you can see God through the window versus just looking at yourself. And this is what happens to people who are, whether they're worshiping an idol of their own making or whether they're worshiping the God of self, this is what happens. We look at a mirror, we're only beholding ourselves, and we can only become more and more like those around us. But Noah, Noah was a, Noah, it's easy to take for granted that Noah heard the message from God and built the ark and did all those things. But when we understand that Noah and his family, his small family were really the only true believers in God at the time, it makes the story even more amazing. And we see that Noah, instead of choosing to look to self, instead of choosing to look to himself, he was looking through the window to God. He was seeing God and beholding God. And that's what worship, when we focus on God, that's how we are able to overcome the society around us. But also, a flood was something that was never seen before. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6 verses 13 and 14 it says and god said to noah in the end of all in the the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them 
and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And then verse 17, and behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh, in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. And so, even during that time, there had never been a flood on the earth. It says in Genesis, actually during the creation, that the way that the earth was, the way that the plants received water was that there was a mist that came. And so the world before the flood, the antediluvians, they reasoned that for centuries the laws of nature had been fixed. The reoccurring seasons had come in their order. Heretofore, rain had never fallen. The earth had been watered by a mist or dew. The rivers had never pa yet passed their boundaries, but had borne their water safely to the sea. Fixed decrees had kept the water from overflowing their banks. But these reasoners did not recognize the hand of him who had stayed the waters, saying, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no far further. As time passed on with no apparent change in nature, men whose hearts at times trembled with fear began to be reassured. They reasoned as many reason now that nature is above the God of nature and that her laws are so firmly established that God himself could not change them. And so we see not only was the world corrupt during the time of Noah, not only was there violence and evil and all these, these things, but there was a lack of faith even in the word of God, even though God said that there would be a flood, even though God said that this was coming. Some, uh, we know from the, the spirit of prophecy, some believed for a time, but then they reasoned in themselves that, well, this thing kind of thing has never happened before. Why would it happen? But we are going to take a look at why Noah was different. So, but from this, we can understand we can understand that we can withstand the unbelief and corruption around us by looking to Jesus and the Bible and not to ourselves. But what was the source of Noah's faith? Let's go to Genesis 6 and 8 and 9. And it says that, here, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. So Noah's faith did not come from nothing. It says that Noah was a man perfect in his generations. This is a little chart. You can probably not see it too well, but this is a chart of the, the generations uh, that happened from Adam to Noah. And we see here great men of faith. We see Adam, we see Seth, we see Enoch, Methuselah, all these you know, men of these patriarchs that we see. And you can actually see that some of them, how they lived, like how long they lived, and that they lived, and how they lived at the same time as other people. So for example, Methuselah, he died the year that the ark uh, the year that the flood came. And actually, we know from Spirit of Prophecy, he actually helped to build the ark as well. So we see that he lived during the time of Noah. The little black parts overlap. But was Noah just a person of faith because he had family who believed in God? Well, no. Although Noah lived at the same time as Methuselah, and he lived just a few generations after Enoch, we see something very important from the verse that we just read. It says here, it says here that in verse 9, Noah walked with God. It's so important because it says here, that Noah found grace and favor in the sight of God because Noah had a relationship with God. Noah walked with God in his daily life. This was not just something that happened 
once, oh, he built the ark and that, like, out of nothing. It was because he had a daily walk with God. And what does a daily walk with God look like? What does that even look like in real life? First, let's go to Romans, Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. And it says here, it gives us where do we, first of all, where do we get faith in our lives? Where, what is the source of faith? Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. For I say, though through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has given each and every one of us a, a part of faith. But if, if he gives us a measure, like think of a little measuring cup, like he's measured out to us a little bit of faith. But our faith is not like, uh, just like a little, I would say, not like sand. Our faith is like seeds. It can be cultivated. It can be grown. God, but in order for it to grow, we must walk with God in our daily life. We must experience God in our daily life. And so what does it look like to walk with God? Let's see. Well, something that I've learned in my experience with God is that Walking with God in your daily life sometimes looks like this. So this is the story. I, uh, before I came here to Westchester, I used to canvas a lot. <laughs> this is a picture of me canvassing in Texas. This is my friend Orion. She's from my school. And I, you know, I canvassed in Texas. I canvassed in Michigan. I've canvassed in Utah and, and California. Um, but even though I've canvassed like several times, I am not necessarily someone who's always like, oh, I want to go out and canvas. This is so much fun. Like, I should all, we should all canvas. But, you know, I, I, I remember this two weeks ago. You know, I came, I came to Westchester. And one of the things that they teach us at, at my school, my missionary school that I was at, was that when you're Bible working, you should canvas. It's great. Like, it's great to go out and canvas. <laughs> and... Week one went by, week two went by, week three went by, week four went by. I hadn't canvassed. And I, you know, I was thinking, oh, I could canvass, maybe, I don't know. Like, but I remember after, you know, going through several weeks here and, you know, thinking like, Lord, like I really want to be able to not just do Bible studies with the people that Christian was doing Bible studies with. I wanted to have new Bible studies to do. And so I, I was like, okay, Lord, well, let me pray. So I prayed, Lord, show me what to do today. Like, show me, guide me, what should I do today? And I remember that prayer. I prayed that prayer, and the Lord spoke back. He said, you need to go out and canvas. I was like, oh, I mean, I could do something else. Like, you know, I, I'm sure there's something else I could do besides canvas today. But the Lord put, came back even stronger. It was like, no, Veronica, you need to go out and canvas. And I was like, oh, okay, Lord, I'll go out and canvas. And, you know, I, I remember, like, this was not something that was easy for me because I, Jane and I have been doing our, our, week of, our, our 10 days of, 11 days of prayer. And I remember I was like, Jane, like, just pray because I need to surrender this to God. I need to, like, have this, you know, be willing to do what God tells me to do. And it was not easy for me, but I decided to go out door to door in the neighborhood, you know, just right here, and to go and, sh you know, share the books that I had, I, you know, that they had at the house, some of the books we had. And I went out for just two hours, not even that long. <laughs> and I just remember I met uh, the first... Uh, hour or so, I met a lady who was living in the neighborhood. She was, doesn't live here. She works for one of the people who live here. And she was saying, you know, I'm really into health. I love, like, you know, eating healthy, and I'm actually vegetarian. I was like, oh, really? Oh, wow, okay. 
So we talked about that because I'm vegetarian and I shared and we talked. And then I was saying, oh, well, what? Uh, uh, so I, I showed her, I left her with a health book. And then I remember showing her a list of things that our church is hoping to, to help people with, including Bible studies. And she was like, well, can I pick more than one? And I was like, yeah, you can pick more than one because there was healthy, you know, semina health seminars and then there was Bible studies. And so she, I remember she picked Bible studies and right as she said that, I was rebuked. I was like, Lord, I didn't want to go out today. <laughs> you bless me. And I know so many times in my experience when I've not wanted to do what God has told me to do. And for you, it may not look like going out and canvassing, but it may be you meet somebody and the Lord tells you, you need to pray for them or you need to ask them, uh, you need to engage with them, you need to talk to them. And you may think, oh Lord, like, you know, that's so strange. People don't talk to each other, talk to anyone anymore. But God may surprise you with a divine appointment. And so when the Lord speaks to you and you listen, that is what it looks like to walk with God. When the Lord speaks, when you pray, you ask God, Lord, what should I do? And God tells you, and you, you're continuing to dwell with him throughout your day. That's how that looks. And so when we have a relationship with God and we learn to trust him in the small things, it helps us to trust him in the bigger tests to our character. And lastly, let's go to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. Back to Genesis 6 and verses 14 through 22. And it says here, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch and this is how you shall make it the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits you shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and shall set the door of the ark in its side you shall make it with a lower and second third and third decks and behold i myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy it from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life, everything that is on the earth shall die. But you will, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, every creeping thing on the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself all the food that is eaten, and you shall gather to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Okay, God told him all these things that he was to do. It was supposed to be a certain, the cubits were supposed to be, it had to be this size. You had to have three decks. It had to have all these things. The door, they had to have the door on the side. And then what was Noah's response? And it says in verse 22, Thus Noah did according to all God had commanded him. So he did. So Noah did everything that God asked him in every particular. He showed him that he believed by acting in faith and building the ark, exactly how God told him to build it. If Noah had said he believed God, but he did not build the ark, he would not have been saved from the flood. In the same way, if we say we believe in God, but we don't choose to build our lives on God and his word, we really do not have a saving faith. And where do we get this whole idea of, of this, this, um, this fact that Noah was part of this family of faith? In, we get this idea in Hebrews chapter 11. Chapter 11. How can we be part of the same family of faith as Noah? And it says in 
Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah became an heir of righteousness, part of this family of righteousness, not because he had Methuselah or Enoch or any of these great patriarchs as his ancestors, but because he believed and acted on the promises of God. And so even though there are challenges to us believing, and even though we have the, the world around us may, or the people around us, or even our families may not fall, just choose to follow God, when we hold to the source of faith, and when we act in accordance with, with God's promises, we will be part of the same lineage of faith of which Abraham and Noah and Moses were a part. When I first went to Arizona to go to my Bible college, the first weekend we were there, after lunch, they told us, we're going to go hiking. And I'd been on these nice little hikes in Michigan, maybe up some dunes or something. Like, you know, it, it, you know they, weren't, they weren't that easy. But when they took us to this, I was like, oh, we're going to go to the top of that. Wow, that's, that's pretty intense. <laughs> this is called, this is, in, this is Thumb Butte, because it kind of looks like a thumb, uh, in Prescott, Arizona. And so this is about like 15 minutes away from my school. And so at the base of the mountain, the pathway started off pretty smooth. It was a bit steep, though, so I was actually like huffing and puffing. But it did not seem insurmountable. I, I'm like, yeah, I can walk, you know, this is fine. I remember that <laughs> my friends Rachel and Tiffany, we all hiked together, you know, as the rest just kind of sped on ahead. Everyone else who was fit, they just kind of left us behind. And we took periodic stops every few minutes just to catch our breath because it was pretty steep. And after a while, I decided to hike a little faster to try to catch up with some of the others. And so coming up behind me was another uh, guy from our group that was huffing and puffing as he walked. He was carrying a gallon container of water, and he wore a baseball cap. To this day, I do not know who he was, and I had thought he was a new student, but I never saw him again. Soon the guy caught up with me, along with another girl that was with him, and I, they were all, and I was huffing and puffing as well. The hot Arizona sun beat down on all of us as we rested at the place where the path curved around another sloping at ascent. I took out my small little ration of water, I got this little bottle of water when I was on the shuttle on the way to my school. So this is just this tiny little bottle of water. That was all I had. And I remember thinking that I was just so thirsty. And so I said this, you know, out loud. And the guy was like, oh, you should take some of my water. And I remember thinking, I was like, I don't like sharing water with people. But then I was like, oh, like I'm so thirsty. So I took, I took his water, refilled my water bottle. And then we kept going. But I felt, you know, like it was going to be a pretty, pretty steep walk up the rest of the way. So we were about halfway up the mountain. And it was just me and the other guy who I don't know his name, so I'm just going to call him Daniel. And perhaps one more other person who were with us. They were, so then we... We were walking about halfway up there. We saw a group of parents who were, you know, just kind of in uh, sitting. And we asked them why they had stopped and why they were not going to finish climbing to the top of the mountain. And they said, oh, it gets pretty steep on up the road. Yeah, we're kind of, we're too old for that. But you guys go on ahead. You know, go have fun. It, you know, so we were like, oh, okay. So at this point, we, you know, at this point, we decided to go see you know, what was up the rest of the way. 
you know, we, we thought about turning back, but we're like, oh, we're kind of curious, so let's just keep going. And so I followed Daniel through a less traveled path up the mountain. Finally, we arrived at the place where the rocks went completely vertical. The only way to get to the top of the mountain was to climb, not walk. By now, we had actually uh, caught up with some of the others. Um, my friends Manny and Victor and some other girls, they, they, you know, they were kind of up. They had already kind of gotten a little further up than us. And I looked to see if Daniel was going to keep going. <laughs> he continued to complain, but he threw his water bottle up the side of the mountain and began to climb. Once he got to a good resting place, he turned to me and said, do you want help? Are you coming? And I was like, uh. I looked at the rocks. I looked at how far the footholds would be from each other. And I decided to climb this part of the mountain. I would, if I decided to climb it, then there would be no turning back, unless I wanted to come back down by myself. I don't know. This looks very dangerous, I said. But after some encouragement from him and some of the other people that had already gotten a little further, I decided to climb. I reached up for Daniel's hand, and he pulled me up to the next foothold. And after several minutes of climbing, we finally made it to a plateau. But there was still so much more to climb. But Daniel continued to help me with through the difficult parts. With his help, I made it to the top. And this is me on the top of the mountain. It was so great. It was so pretty. I loved it. Um, <laughs> The view at the top was amazing, and it was an exhilarating feeling to realize that I had climbed all the way to the top of this mountain that had at the bottom seemed so impossible to ascend. But as amazing as the view was, I knew that I could not have made it to the top if Daniel had not offered to help me. And it is the same way for us. The challenges we face from life may seem insurmountable. It may seem like no one around us wants to climb the mountain of faith, some may even ridicule us for our belief in God, and we ourselves may feel weak and tired and unable to continue on this pilgrim journey. But I want you to know that we have with us a sympathizing friend, that Jesus wants to help us to get to the top of this Christian journey. So friends, is it your desire today to trust God in both the little and the small thing, the small things and the big things in your life and to ask God to give you faith to trust in him despite the circumstances around you. You know that I want to trust God in those things. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the, even though we go through these difficult times, Lord, even though we have challenges to our faith, that you are our friend that helps us to be able to get through these difficult times and that when we trust in you lord when we take you at your word father that we can truly be successful in this christian walk lord god i just want to ask that you will be with each and every one of us lord be with those who are tempted be with those who are going through difficult family situations be with those who lord even even doubt uh that you care about them Father, I pray that you will show each and every one of us personally, Lord, that you are our friend, you are our brother, that you care about us, and Father, that you can help us to have the faith that it takes to be successful on this Christian journey. Thank you so much, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.